Day 11, day of September 2023, the case number is 20A113B23, state against the Medical and Medical Council. Worship of the Commission, the Sergeant Officer, Mr. Robison, Mr. Ali, 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 Mr. Ali,
and the onus rests upon the applicant to satisfy the court that the interest of justice permits her release on bail. After the affidavits by the applicant and the investigating officer were dealt with, the defence indicated that they are now placing in dispute that the offences results under Schedule 5 and they gave their reasons for their submission but proceeded with their closing arguments. In response to this, the prosecutor handed a written confirmation in terms of Section 60, Subsection 11, Capital A, Subsection A, into court. And I quote directly from the confirmation that Nandipa, Magudumana and 11 others be arraigned on four counts of contravening Section 3A and B of Act 12 of 2004, Corruption. 2.5 million was offered and 40,000 and 85,000 rand was paid and 500,000 was offered and 10,000 rand was paid. For the purpose of bail proceedings, the contravention of Section 3, Subsection A and Subsection B of Act 12 of 2004, Corruption falls under Schedule 5 of the Criminal Procedure Act as it involves amounts of more than 500,000 rand or it involves amounts of more than 100,000 rand. If it is alleged that the offence was committed by a person, group of persons or syndicate acting in the execution or furtherance of common purpose or conspiracy. Now the value of this confirmation that was issued by the Director of Public Prosecutions is the following. In terms of Section 60, Subsection 11, Capital A of the Criminal Procedure Act, the Director of Public Prosecutions, who has jurisdiction in this matter, may at any stage before plea issue this written confirmation to confirm if she intends charging a person with an offence which results under Schedule 5 or 6, even if the charge does not reflect the same. Secondly, this written confirmation shall as soon as possible be handed into court and it forms part of the record of the proceedings. Thirdly, whenever the question arises in bail proceedings whether a person is charged with an offence under Schedule 5 or 6, the written confirmation shall upon its mere production be prima facie proof of the charges to be brought against such a person. Prima facie proof becomes conclusive proof in the absence of evidence to the contrary. This court does not have any evidence to the contrary, therefore the application will be done in terms of Schedule 5 and the onus rests upon the applicant to satisfy the court that the interest of justice permits her release on bail as initially agreed. Due to the fact that the dispute regarding this schedule was only raised during closing arguments. I'm satisfied that the applicant would not have approached her application differently <coughs> and furthermore due to the fact that this dispute was clarified by the certificate issued by the DPP, the applicant's counsel was still addressing the court in closing. I find the closing arguments would not have been approached differently. The issue that was raised by the applicant's counsel regarding the unlawful amendment of the affidavit of the investigating officer by the prosecutor must also be addressed by me. I refer back to the affidavit and the arguments of the parties regarding this issue. I'm satisfied that it was merely a typing error in the affidavit that was clarified by the prosecutor while he read the affidavit into the record. If one looks at the word that was typed, the word was grace. And if one looks at the context in which the word was used, it referred to digging up a grave. It is clear that the word grace makes no sense and that the investigating officer wanted to say grave. So it's merely a spelling mistake 
it's a trivial issue which was not even worth mentioning and I'm not going to say any further, uh, anything further about it, safe to say that it does not affect the value of the affidavit. It does not make the affidavit unlawful. So I will now proceed with my judgment. Before I start, I just want to also place on record whatever I say must also be read with the words allegedly. It's alleged by the defense and the state and all the allegations by the state must still be proved during the trial in the trial court. So if I summarize the evidence and make the evidence applicable to the law and come to a conclusion, please remember that I add the words allegedly. But I'm not going to repeatedly say the words allegedly because it's unnecessary repetition of those words. The applicant has a duty to satisfy the court that it's in the interest of justice to permit her release on bail and the onus of proof is on her and she must prove it on a balance of probabilities. The application for bail was dealt with by her by handing in an affidavit and attached to it was a confirmatory affidavit that was done by a friend of hers. The state opposed her application and handed in an affidavit that was compiled by the investigating officer, Lieutenant Flyman. Both the state and the defense presented arguments by reading the heads of argument into the record, or the written arguments rather, into the record. The applicant placed her personal circumstances on record and indicated that she would stay with her friend whose confirmatory affidavit was handed in if she is released on bail. She's been a permanent resident in South Africa all her life. She's no relatives or assets outside the Republic. Her parents live in Port Edward. She's been separated from her husband. She has two young children with him. She's a medical practitioner and was practicing at her aesthetic clinic in Santon before she was arrested. She earned an income of approximately 50,000 rand a month. She has no fixed asset, assets, but her movable assets value range in the region of 1 million rand. Her passport was confiscated in Tanzania when she was arrested. She has no previous convictions or pending criminal cases against her. <coughs> as far as the departure from South Africa is concerned, she states that she was forced into a vehicle by case number five, Mr. Bester. He threatened her and he took her out of the country against her will. She was defenseless, helpless and scared and she had no one to <coughs> report to. She was arrested by the South African police in Tanzania and the members of the police found passports in the cubby hole of the vehicle. One of the passports belonged to the applicant. She was not aware of the presence of her passport in the vehicle. She intends to plead not guilty to all the charges <coughs> against her. She indicated that she is not a danger to the public or any, any individual. She will not attempt to evade her trial and to live as a fugitive. She will not interfere with law with any of the witnesses and she has not attempted to influence or intimidate any witnesses so far. She has not supplied false information to the investigating officer or to the court during her bail application. She is in a position to pay 10,000 rand bail and she will abide by all bail, bail conditions as set by the court. Her friend confirmed that the applicant will reside with her at her <coughs> Santon home, which she owns. She's the owner of the property since the 1st of January 2022, if the accused is or the applicant is released on bail. This was the applicant's case. The prosecutor read the investigating officer's affidavit into record. According to this affidavit, the state has evidence in the form of statements from witnesses 
of the following issues. The applicant is in a relationship with Accused Number 5. Accused Number 5 was at G4S Mangaung Correctional Prison serving a life sentence for murder and rape. The applicant and her co-accused acted in common purpose to commit the crimes that they are charged with and the purpose was to assist accused number five, Mr. Bester, to escape. The applicant and accused number five were the masterminds in planning this escape. In order to facilitate the escape, a sequence of events followed from the 7th of April 2022 until the date of the escape, which was during the night of the 3rd of May 22. The applicant claimed an unidentified body from the state mortuary in Bloemfontein, making a false <coughs> claim that the body is that of her father. <coughs> she held a funeral and the body was buried. It was exhumed this year only to discover that the coffin did not contain human remains. This body was discovered last year after it was claimed floating in the Kopenong River. <coughs> it is back in the mortuary awaiting to be claimed by the family. It was later discovered that the applicant claimed and buried another unidentified body, which she claimed to be a brother of accused number nine. In this grave, only three bags of mealy meal was found and no human remains. A rental car was used to smuggle the body into the correctional facility and it was hidden in the workshop on the 29th of April 2022. This body was smuggled into a case number five cell in the early hours of the morning on the 3rd of May 2022. The body was set alight in order to create the impression that it was a case number five that committed suicide. The CCTV system was disconnected and this is how accused number five managed to escape. On the 5th of May, the applicant and accused number five, oh sorry, the applicant and accused number two, who is her father, claimed the charred body that was found in the cell. The applicant filed an affidavit wherein she declared that the body is her partner and that he has no other relatives. She arranged for the body to be transported to Gauteng to be cremated. After the body was transported, a preliminary post-mortem revealed that the cause of death was blunt trauma to the head and not smoke inhalation. The police intervened and stopped the release of the body to the applicant. The biological mother of accused number five was traced DNA results confirmed that she is the biological mother of accused number five, who was still alive. The applicant approached the High Court with an urgent application to have the body released for her to enable her to arrange for a private autopsy and the burial of the deceased whom she claimed to be accused number five. She filed an affidavit in support of this application which turned out to be a false affidavit. A false court order was served on the respondents, which is the investigating officer as well, ordering the body to be released to the Hillbrow mortuary before the 22nd of May 2022. It was later proved that this body was the body of Katleho Pering and not a case number five. There is evidence that the case number one was promised millions to arrange this escape and he arranged for a case number three, six, seven, eight, ten and twelve to assist him. The evidence shows that the applicant paid 85,000 rand to a case number one. It appears that this escape was successful until March 2023. When the media revealed that the applicant and accused number five were seen shopping at a mall in Gauteng. 
the estate agent who rented a property at 22A Second Road Hyde Park in Santon to the applicant and 64A Collin Drive River Club to the applicant for her parents to use stated that the applicant and accused number 5 removed their belongings from their Santon property on the 21st of March 2023. And that was the last time that they had seen them on the property. Her parents was also instructed by the applicant to vacate their home on the 24th of March 2023, the one that she rented for them. On the 7th of April 2023, the applicant and accused number five, Mr. Bester, were arrested in Tanzania on their way to Kenya. They were arrested on the 13th of April 2023 at Lanseria Airport in South Africa by the South African police. There's also evidence that the applicant <coughs> rented a black Mercedes Benz in South Africa and this vehicle was found abandoned in Zimbabwe before she was arrested. The investigating officer also mentioned in his affidavit that there's absolutely no evidence that the applicant was forced or threatened to accompany accused number five. She did not open a kidnapping case against accused number five after her arrest. There's a border post between South Africa, Zimbabwe and Zambia on the way to Tanzania. She never alerted any of the authorities of her being forced to go with accused number five. The investigating officer is mainly opposed to bail with reference to section 60 subsection 4b the likelihood that the applicant will attempt to evade her trial if she is released on bail in support of this he indicates that the applicant provided the address in Santon to him on the 14th of april 2023 as her address while she knew that she already vacated the home on the 21st of march so she provided false information to him regarding her address as she was no longer staying there. He also stated that she's not permitted to practice as a doctor anymore because she did not pay her fees to the Health Profession Council. The applicant is married to someone else and has two school-going children with him. The children are currently living with their father since March 2023 when she left with Mr. Bester, accused number five. She does not own any fixed property, but she owns vehicles. The applicant was in possession of two passports when she was arrested. The owner of the passports made a statement to the effect that the applicant deceived her in, or in order to hand her passport to the applicant. None of the passports were used during the time that she left South Africa until she was brought back to South Africa. Further criminal cases of fraud amounting to millions of rand were registered against her from February 23 up to July 2023. If the applicant is convicted, she will face long terms of imprisonment. He further based his opposition to bail <coughs> on the grounds listed in subsection C, D and E of the Act motivating each point which i will not repeat at this stage but it is on record the strength of the state's case in bail proceedings we do not hold a trial to determine the guilt of the applicant but the strength of the state's case is one of the factors to consider under section 60 subsection 4. It is, however, important as a starting point to establish that there is sufficient evidence against the applicant in order to charge her. The certificate that the state handed in that was issued by the Dir Director of Public Prosecutions, Ms. Navila Sumaru, is prima facie proof that there is sufficient evidence to charge the applicant on the corruption charges. The state has supplied the court with an affidavit setting out the facts of the case and indicated that the evidence against her consists of documentary evidence, fingerprints on a document, witness statements from eyewitnesses and other, witness, other witnesses. Then the state will also rely on circumstantial evidence. 
The affidavit of the state was strongly criticized by the defense because he did not contain more detail, but I find that it contains sufficient information for me to conclude that there is sufficient information before me in order to come to a conclusion that there is a relatively strong case against the applicant on many of the charges that she's facing, including the corruption charges. In deciding whether the applicant satisfies the court that it is in the interest of justice to release her on bail, the court applies section 60, subsection 4, A to E. And I'm going to quote this. So the interest of justice do not permit the release from detention of an accused where one or more of the following grounds are established. It is important to note that only one of the grounds needs to be established. Subsection A, where there is a likelihood that the accused, if he or she were released on bail, will endanger the safety of the public or any particular person or will commit a schedule one offence. B, where there is a likelihood that the accused, if he or she were released on bail, will attempt to evade his or her trial. C, where there is a likelihood that the accused, if he or she were released on bail, will attempt to influence or intimidate witnesses or to conceal or destroy evidence. Where there is a likelihood that the accused, if he or she were released on bail, will undermine or jeopardize the objectives or the proper functioning of the criminal justice system, including the bail system. E, in exceptional circumstances. Now, E is only taken into account in exceptional circumstances. In exceptional circumstances, there is the likelihood that the release of the accused will disturb the public order or undermine public peace or security. It is important to keep in mind that the word likelihood means that there must be evidence to support this likelihood. It must not only be based on a suspicion without any substance. The reason for the investigating officer to oppose bail does not lie in subsection 4, subsection A, but mostly in subsection 4B, which is the flight risk. But the court must have regard to all the factors in section 64, subsection A to E. So I'm going to start with subsection A first. The likelihood that the applicant will endanger the safety of the public or a particular person. In considering this ground, in subsection 5, we are guided are certain factors that were also laid out by the legislator to assist us in coming to a conclusion. And the court may take into account the following factors. The degree of violence towards others implicit in the charge against the accused, a threat of violence which the accused may have made to a person, resentment the accused is alleged to harbour against any person any disposition of violence on the part of the accused, which is evident from her past conduct. In any disposition of the accused to commit offences referred to in Schedule 1, as is evident from her past conduct. None of these are applicable to the applicant, because there is no evidence before this court that she has any previous convictions, pending cases, that there was any threats or violence against anyone issued by the applicant. It is on record that the fraud charges were opened against her since February this year, involving large sums of money, but she has not been charged with those offences yet, so they are not regarded as pending matters. The prevalence of the offence must also be taken into account. Corruption is a prevalent offence in our country. We have specialised units dealing with corruption. With the rising cost of living and the low salaries of people on the ground doing important work, people are easily tempted to accept money to neglect their duties. But it's not only committed by them, corruption is committed for a myriad of reasons. In considering the flight risk, the court is also guided by certain factors that were listed in the Act 
under subsection 6. The court must take into account the emotional, family, community or occupational ties of the accused to the place at which he or she will be tried. She will be tried in Bloemfontein. Her family ties are in Port Shepston with her dad, Santon and so forth. But I will regard South Africa as the place where she will be tried. The applicant is a South African citizen. She was born and bred here. Her parents are still alive. They're also living in South Africa. She has two young children who are currently living with their father. She has friends, other relatives in South Africa. She was the owner of a business in Gauteng. It appears that she's also involved in other business ventures. On the other hand, she apparently left all of this behind to leave this country with the case number five. For a place which is still not known to us, she was found in Tanzania, which is according to the investigating officer approximately 3,500 kilometers away from everyone. Even though she claims that she was kidnapped by a case number five, as correctly pointed out by the prosecutor, she is not facing any charges for crossing the border or any borders in this country. So there should really be no reason why she would elect not to disclose the full information regarding her kidnapping to the court. It must be kept in mind that the applicant has the duty to satisfy the court that the interest of justice permits her release on bail on a balance of probabilities and this includes satisfying the court that she is not a flight risk. Under B, we're dealing with the assets held by the applicant and where the assets are situated. The applicant does not own any fixed property. She owns movable assets to the value of a million rand. Movable assets can be disposed of with relative ease without her intervention. The evidence shows that she vacated the home where she lived before she left the country with case number five. We have no idea what happened to her furniture and her movable assets. Or rather, I do not have any idea. At this stage, she has no fixed address of her own. But accommodation was offered to her by a friend in Santa. Under subsection C, the court takes into account the means and the travel documents held by the accused, which may enable her to leave the country. This is an interesting one. Her passport was confiscated by the authorities. So she doesn't have a passport anymore in her possession. But the evidence indicates that she does not really need a passport of her own to leave the borders of this country and to travel across borders. Because this passport that was confiscated had no indication that she crossed any borders legally between March 2023 and April 2023 when she was arrested. But she crossed a few borders with accused number five. It's a good indication that she has the necessary means, the know-how to leave the country. D, the extent, if any, to which the accused can afford to forfeit the amount of bail which may be set. At this stage, the real financial means of the applicant is not known to the court. Under E, the question whether the extradition of the accused would readily be affected should she be flee across the borders of the Republic in an attempt to evade her trial. This is also a difficult one to answer, as we still do not know where the applicant in accused number five was heading to. The nature and gravity of the charge on which the applicant is to be charged. The applicant is facing many charges which are of a serious nature. Most of them contains elements of dishonesty and deceit. The strength of the case against the applicant and the incentive that he or she may have in consequence to attempt to avoid her trial is the next factor to be taken into account. The state's case is relatively strong against her. Chances of a conviction is good. The evidence is based on direct evidence, documentary evidence, other circumstantial evidence indicating 
She played a leading role in committing most of these offences. Under H, the nature and gravity of the punishment which is likely to be imposed should the accused be convicted of the charges against her. If she's convicted, she will most definitely be sentenced to a long period of direct imprisonment. But it is difficult to judge at this stage. It will depend on the trial court and it will depend on the circumstances that will be placed before the trial court when they consider sentence. Under subsection I, the binding effect and enforceability of bail conditions which may be imposed at the and the ease with which such conditions could be breached or any other factor which in the opinion of the court should be taken into account. If one looks at the evidence presented by the investigating officer and the number of people who were charged with the applicant, the positions that they held, their places of employment, one of them is even her biological father, one of them one of her employees. It appears that she and accused number five were able to convincingly deceive everyone to work with them. All these people <coughs> risk their employment to assist in exchange for money which was not even paid to them after the escape was successfully carried through. It also appears that they could get through a few border posts successfully without using their passports, so it's possible that they managed to convince the authorities at the border post to let them through. I'm of the opinion that bail conditions will not be of assistance to get the applicant to stand her trial. If the applicant is released on bail, she will have more opportunities and means to once again attempt to assist Mr. Bester to escape. We must remember that this trial must still proceed and it will be a lengthy trial. Mr. Bester will be transported to and from court for the duration of the trial. By allowing the applicant to go out on bail will enable her to yet again try to facilitate another escape if she wants to. If one looks at the evidence that the state has, the applicant was the main role player in facilitating the escape of case number five. If she's out on bail, nothing will stand in her way. <coughs> she will ac have access to all the necessary information and people to facilitate another escape. Subsection C, where there's a likelihood that the accused, if he or she were released on bail, will attempt to influence or intimidate witnesses, conceal or destroy evidence. Um, the court must here take into account the fact that the accused is familiar with the identity of the witnesses and the evidence which they may bring to her. Uh, the names of the witnesses were listed and made available in court to all the accused to whom bail was granted. The applicant does not have access to the witness statements yet, but she would know what many of them would be able to testify about. For example, she would know who she approached at the different mortuaries to claim bodies and so on. I'm also aware of a friend of hers who is a possible witness with regard to the passport that was handed over to the applicant under false pretenses. The court must also look at whether the witnesses already made statements and agreed to testify from the evidence of the investigating officer. Most of those statements have been obtained from the witnesses. Whether they agree to testify is not a question. Witnesses can be compelled to testify, even if they do not agree to testify, unless they may lawfully be excused from testifying, for example, if one of the witnesses are married to the applicant. Subsection C, whether the investigation against the accused has already been completed. Um, the matter has been postponed to October for further investigation, so there is investigation outstanding. I'm not sure if it was concluded or not at this stage. I must just say that each application for a postponement will be considered on its own merits. And if there is an unreasonable delay in the investigation, which is causing substantial prejudice to any party, I will deal with it in terms of Section 342A as required 
怪的路。Good also takes into account the relationship of the accused with the various witnesses and the extent to which they could be influenced or intimidated. And how effective and enforceable bail conditions will, will be to prohibit communication between the accused and the witnesses. I'm unable to comment on this aspect. I have no idea if there are any witnesses who are related to the applicant, except for the one friend who handed the passport to the applicant under false pretenses. When we look at subsection F and G, whether the accused has access to evidentiary material and the ease with which evidentiary material could be concealed or destroyed, I cannot find any evidence that the, these factors are at risk. If one moves to subsection 4D, the court takes into account the following factors. Subsection A, 8A, the fact that the accused knowing it to be false supplied false information at the time of her arrest during the, or during the bail proceedings. I've already dealt with this. The applicant provided an address to the investigating officer in April 2023 when she was arrested and the address was of a property that she already vacated during March 2023. At that stage, that was not her address anymore but she gave it up as her address. The rest of the factors listed in the subsection is not applicable to the applicant. If one moves to subsection E, um, when exceptional circumstances, there is a likelihood that the release of the accused will disturb public order or undermine public peace or security. These will only be taken into account under exceptional circumstances. All I can say about this is that there are certain aspects that the applicant has been accused of which indeed has the potential to induce a sense of shock in the community. For example, the way in which the unidentified bodies of the deceased were disposed of. But the rest of this, I am not going to take any of those into account in making my decision. I'm of no way convinced that the release of the applicant would lead to public disorder. It could lead to shock, but this should in no way sway the court to refuse bail. There's no evidence before this court that the life of the applicant would be at risk if she is released on bail. And before the court makes a final decision, it is important for the court to take into account subsection 9. Subsection 9 deals with the weighing up of the interest of justice against the right of the accused to a personal freedom and in particular the prejudice that she is likely to suffer if she is to be detained in custody. And here the court is also guided by certain factors. Subsection A deals with the period for which the accused has already been in custody since her arrest. At this stage she is in custody for five months. Investigation is not completed yet. The probable period of detention until disposal and conclusion of the trial must be taken into account. I've already been informed that the matter will go to the High Court for trial in Bloemfontein. It is not possible for me to determine what time frame we are looking at. A trial date has not been arranged yet. If I look at the list of witnesses that were handed into court previously, the number of accused, I can safely say that it will be a long drawn out trial which can take several months to reach a conclusion. The court must also look at the reason for any delay in disposal and conclusion of the trial and fault on the part of the accused. No one is to blame for the fact that the investigation is not complete. In complicated matters like these with so many charges, the investigation normally takes a very long time. It takes longer than usual 
to get all the loose ties together. Just like the defence will require sufficient time to prepare for trial, the state also requires sufficient time to get ready and prepare for trial. Financial loss the accused must suffer owing to her detention. That is one of the factors to be considered. The detention of a person who was employed or self-employed before arrest will almost always lead to financial loss. But in this particular case, it's important to remember that the applicant allegedly deserted her family and her business to leave with a case number five. The applicant did not present any evidence to the court of the country, except for stating under oath in her affidavit that she was kidnapped by him. There is strong evidence by the state which is not supporting her allegation that accused number five kidnapped her. We also look at um, any impediment to the preparation of the accused defence or delay in obtaining legal representation which may be brought <coughs> about by the detention of the accused and the state of health of the accused or the applicant. The applicant has obtained the services of an advocate, Advocate Lamini and Advocate Maud Lahung, to assist her during the bail application and it appears that there was nothing preventing them from properly consulting with the applicant in order to proceed with this bail application. She also appears to be in good health. No allegation of ill health was ever brought to my attention. The court can also take any other factor into account which is in the opinion of the court relevant. I take into account that the applicant is detained in a correctional facility where she's taken well care of. Whenever she appeared before me, she appeared to be well groomed and in a good state of health. I'm confident that all her reasonable needs are met during her period of detention, awaiting trial. I never received a complaint from her regarding the circumstances under which she is being detained. I did, however, receive a complaint regarding her transportation to the court from the facility, but this aspect was addressed and I accept it was suitably resolved because I did not receive any further complaints. As far as her children are concerned, they are with a biological father. It's always sad that children should be separated from their mother, but this is also a choice that was apparently exercised by the applicant when she left the country with accused number five. When she left, she knew that she most probably will not return. Whenever she left under circumstances that she was kidnapped, whether that happened, that will come out during the trial. At this stage, all the evidence available points in the direction that she left voluntarily. She claimed in her affidavit that she was unaware of the presence of her passport and the other passport in the cubby hole of the vehicle, but a witness filed a statement to the effect that the applicant deceived her in handing the passport to the applicant. The fact that they did not leave with one of the applicant's vehicles, but in a rented vehicle, which they used to leave in the country, is also an indication that they intended to leave the country so that they would not be traced, to wipe out any trace of them. In conclusion, I find that the applicant is a definite flight risk and that no bail condition will assist under the circumstances to limit this risk. After weighing up the personal circumstances and the interest of the applicant and her constitutional right to freedom against the interest of justice, I find that she did not satisfy the court that it's in the interest of justice for her to be released on bail. It is, however, in the interest of justice that matters be tried and that a verdict be obtained in a court of law, and this can only happen if a person stands trial. Therefore, her application to be released on bail is refused. As it is, Thank you. 
Ms. Magurumane, your matter is postponed to 11 October. It is for further investigation and you will remain in custody until then. Thank you. Court adjourned.